Good evening to the guest of honor, Reno scientist from different educational institutions, audience, and my fellow mates. I, Shruti Sinha, pursuing Masters of Science from Institute of Bioinformatics and Biotechnology, I'm delighted to host this session of coronavirus webinar series. There have been such series all around the world. However, our motto is to reach out to those people who may not belong to the background of biotechnology or life sciences. They could be simple lawyers or economists or just children or anybody around you. So we want to clear out the myths and confusions and all the misunderstandings that are occurring with this, with this concept. So we try to pour it in a simplified way from the top experts in our field. I am honored to welcome our esteemed guest, Dr. Arindam Metra. Dr. Arindam Metra is an associate professor and scientist at the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, Kalyani, West Bengal. He has pursued his PhD from Ames, New Delhi in virology, genetics, and molecular biology. He has been a group leader at the Center of Genomic Application, New Delhi. He is the project manager of the International Cancer Genome Consortium India project on preterm birth. Dr. Metra's research mission is to rise to the challenge of harnessing emerging technologies like massively parallel sequencing to identify the genetic basic of casualty of diseases with specific emphasis on maternal and infant health and cancer. With this said, I would like to hand over to Dr. Metra, who will be talking about genomics of SARS-CoV-2 and its implication for the pandemic. So please take over. Thank you, Shruti. Thank you for this wonderful introduction. It's a bit uh, it's embarrassing also. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy to um, <laughs> participate in today's webinar and, and, and talk to you about the genomics of SARS-CoV-2. So it's quite apparent that uh, I mean, this pandemic brought many of us to the fore in in terms of starting to work on this virus in some ways to contribute to its better understanding of this pandemic and the better understanding of the causal agent for the, of this pandemic, so that uh, some useful um, uh, information for relevant to public health can be generated. I hope I'm uh, visible and I'm just going on the screen now. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. You are visible, and yeah. the screen is also visible. Yes, sure. Please continue. Thanks. Thanks. So, so I, I, as you mentioned, as Shruti mentioned, that I come from an institute called the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, which is located in West Bengal, and um, so the, that's my primary affiliation. And we also also run uh, something called the National Genomics Core, which is uh, a newly set up initiative of the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, to promote genomics in the country by enabling genomic large genomic studies or small genomic studies enable researchers to use genomics for generating useful information for science uh, i also belong to the third logo in my slide is something called the calcutta consortium of human genetics so this is a tribe that i belong to and uh, this is a group of uh, scientists and students who uh, believe in emanating um, uh, or disseminating scientific uh, knowledge on, on the importance of uh, human genetics in uh, public health. And we do that to, in the scientific forum, as well as for the general public and for students. So uh, before I start my talk, I have a disclaimer statement to make. The disclaimer statement is, uh, today, I am going to give you a very lopsided view of things. Um, I am going to talk to you about genomics of SARS-CoV-2, and hopefully I'll be able to address most of your questions that you already have in your mind about SARS-CoV-2. You may have heard something about that and must have read well something about the genomics of SARS-CoV-2. And my, what I will try to do is provide you a, a wider uh, picture of in this aspect. But Having said that, uh, the SARS uh, knowledge of SARS-CoV-2 is incomplete without understanding, and I'm sure there be a lot of there's a lot of curiosity on on the the virus per se, uh, which is the virology aspect of the uh, virus, and 
to answer those questions, the best people are those, uh, the virologists and related researchers who are working night and day in the lab in trying to closely study the virus from aspects which are other than genomics. Also, there are important questions and, and again, uh, curiosity about what is going to happen with the pandemic? Are we going to have a vaccine? What should be the vaccine? What is the treatment regime that should be best effective for uh, the virus? I think people like uh, clinical virologists and those who are working on the forefront in treatment uh, of the infection are the best people to answer those questions and, and, and they should be appropriately contacted. I, having said the disclaimer statement, I also have a con conflict of in interest statement to make that for these talks, when I generally agree to give these talks, I have a in vested interest in doing so. Because I know that in these sessions, there are a lot of young minds uh, who have the potential to uh, actually uh, do wonders in terms of uh, generating and assimilating information uh, in this field. So my, my vested interest is that if during my talk and afterwards, the interactions encourage or motivate any of such young minds to actually take up the subject of genomics for human health and disease as a question to be to for them and as a passion for their uh, for to take up for later on in life. Okay, then uh, I would move on. Uh, as we all know, in spite of a lot of these uh, happenings in and around, although there are a lot of progress made, and very soon we might be hearing more of uh, the vaccine. Uh, that is being talked about against SARS-CoV-2. But at this point of time, when I speak to you, we don't have a vaccine yet. But we have social distancing, we have masks, and we have hand sanitizers and soaps to wash our hands with. And I think these three are very effective, and we all should retain our faith in them and continue to use them as much as possible in our daily lives to stay safe from the infection. So it all this it all began in early December when uh, in the Wuhan seafood market in China. Uh, so the first to give a brief uh, glimpse on the timeline of this outbreak. Uh, about first December, the first documented patient from Wuhan was identified or reported, but this patient was not related to the Wuhan seafood market. But only on eight December. The first case of mysterious pneumonia that was associated with one seafood market was reported. And subsequently, there were cases where uh, more uh, in infections were reported from people who were directly in the one seafood market or people who were like family members or people who had contact with others who were there in one seafood market. And so <clears throat> by 1st January, the market was closed. By 8 January, the first official announcement by the Chinese government was met regarding the uh, this uh, outbreak, and uh, then um, by 11, but things moved very quickly uh, for for this kind of outbreak in this case because by 11 January the first viral genome had already been sequenced. So by 23rd, so there were a lot of questions on whether this is a um, lab strain that was put a uh, set set loose and so forth. I will talk a little bit about that during my, my talk later on. But the uh, see, uh, see, on, by 23rd January, sufficient sequence analysis has been done to categorically state that the sequence of this virus was identical to bat coronaviruses and very similar to pangolin coronavirus. And by 27 January, the evidence of this uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, was found to be present in <coughs> many samples, environmental samples that were collected from the Wuhan uh, seafood market. And uh, subsequently, uh, during this time, what also happened was there were a lot of these, uh, lot of these cluster cases uh, were reported where sequencing was done, and it was established that the viral sequences were uh, from all the cluster cases were those from the uh, found in the index cases in the one seafood market. So this is how the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak came up. Now, if you look, close, look, uh, look closely, a little closer to the virus, 
uh, the virus is like uh, I mean, if you see its its electron micrograph picture, so the virus is has a lot of these structures on its surface, uh, which you all know uh, is is uh, gives this its proverbial name of coronavirus. So these are like crowns, and, and these crowns are actually a very important glycoprotein called the gly spike glycoprotein, which the virus uses to enter the host cell. Now, if you look closely at the if you look uh, at the genome of the SARS-CoV-2, it's a positively stranded RNA virus, and it has a, a substantial part of the genome is consists of ORF one A and one B, and this these these section of the genome is is used for replication of the virals virus in the host cell. So once a virus infects, the this this genes. Uh, which are coded in this ORF 1A and 1B are used uh, for uh, making copies of the virions that are subsequently progeny virions that are generated and and which uh, uh, which are released from the host cell. In addition to this, the, there are a few important structural proteins of the virus. So one is the spike glycoprotein, which I talked to you. That is the most important protein of the virus in terms of uh, entry into the host cell. Then this virus is also enveloped. So that you have an envelope. Um, that's another structural protein. Then you have um, the membrane, and then you have this, an, um, um, uh, and then you have a protein called the nucleocapsid, which is important for the virus. particle to hold the genome in place. In addition to these structural proteins, you have a whole range of non-structural proteins, which are involved in various uh, important functions, um, uh, which are essential for the virus for generating new progeny variants. Now, uh, I go back to this uh, issue that I mentioned earlier, that once the outbreak happened, people were very concerned, and there were still there is this debate uh, about whether this is a um, virus that was made in the lab and which got released in the in the public by accident or this is like a, a, a normal natural evolution uh, that resulted in this virus coming up. Now, till date, uh, there are whatever evidence and the sequencing data that has been generated have actually now sort of made us see that this virus is probably not a man-made virus, which was uh, constructed in the lab. There are certain features in the viral genome which would have been very difficult, nearly impossible to construct. And, uh, and uh, that uh, this, is, this virus has evolved naturally by processes called a zoonosis. Now, why do we say that? One of the evidence, stronger ev pieces of evidences are uh, so one aspect of the virus is that in the spike glycoprotein, there are five amino acid residues, which are very important for binding of the virus to the, uh, to the receptor, uh, the virus receptor and the host cell. And these are, you know, are called the ACE2 receptor. Now, uh, for this uh, receptor binding sites, are these uh, five amino acid residues are very typical. Uh, you don't see this exact combination in any other related uh, coronaviruses. You only see a few of them uh, in different combinations in the bat coronavirus and in pangolin coronaviruses. But this exact sequence of five, five amino acid residues are unique to SARS-CoV-2. Then you also have um, in the in the SARS-CoV-2, you also have a polybasic polybasic cleavage site and O-link glycan residues. Now, these are again uh, unique to the human SARS-CoV-2. Uh, they are not seen in coronaviruses, and hence, uh, it's unlikely that they could have been synthetically constructed. Uh, what is also interesting to know that uh, the, some, some of us believe that this polybasic cleavage site might also function as a, you know, as a, the properties of a super antigen. So, so these are like some some reasons why uh, people think that this virus has a natural evolution. Now, if you look a little closer into three different viral strains and the way the virus evolved from the sequencing data, 
uh, of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses present in bats and pangolins. We understand that SARS-CoV-2 probably evolved from RATG13, which is a horseshoe bat coronavirus. It probably <laughs> It probably did a recombination with un, uh, unknown bat viruses that we do not know which one, and then diverged from RATG13 40 to 70 years ago. Now, once it diverged 40 to 70 years ago, still there was no zoonosis to humans. Now, and I must also mention that uh, the bats are phenomenal reservoirs of viruses. They have a very interesting immune system which results in them harboring many, many viruses, but then they do not get affected by the same. For example, uh, you would uh, probably know that the more uh, interesting of these um, well-known viruses like uh, the rhabdovirus, which is like causes hydrophobia, and off late we had this uh, Nipah viruses, they also harbored and originated from bats. But most of the time you do not see a bat to human zoonosis or a zoonotic jump because the, there is a very little overlap between humans and bats in their natural habitat. So what happens probably is the, bat, the vi viruses from bats get into another mammal and from them they get into a second zoonotic jump into the uh, humans. So again, after diverging from RATG 13, 40 to 70 years ago, it probably somehow uh, got into uh, Malaya pangolins and were circulating in them before crossing over to humans in November, December 2019, um, uh, probably in the Wuhan seafood market. So if you look at so supporting evidences for what I said, so uh, if you look at the overall uh, genome sequence based phylogenetic relationship, we find that uh, the SARS-CoV-2, human SARS-CoV-2 has a close relationship with RATG13. Whereas if you use only these five amino acid, unique five amino acid receptor binding to, uh, sites uh, and, and look at the relationship, we find that the human SARS-CoV-2 is closer to the Malay pangolin virus. And, and if you look at the potential furine uh, recognition motive in the cleavage, S1, S2 cleavage side of the spike glycoprotein, again, you find that the human SARS-CoV-2 is related to both of them, but a little unique. So this is how, what are the combination of evidences which we understand and uh, which we think is this is probably the way the evolution of the virus happened naturally. But of course, uh, there are still a lot of, lot of analysis to do. People, uh, and, and, and I'm sure in future we'll come out with more interesting uh, information. And probably what SARS-CoV-2 has done is made us look more closely into how viral evolutions happen and, and how zoonotic jumps happen. We had always been interested in that, but because of this phenomenal pandemic, now everybody is up and looking very, very hard at this kind of information. So uh, again, if you use, we use phylogenetic data and we also, in addition to sequence these days, we also use time information. And, and we try to go back in time and try to see using the phylogenetic data, which is when probably the, um, the jump into humans, entry into humans happened. And that goes back and predicts about something like first half of December is from the sequence data is what we predict uh, the jump into the humans happen. And that actually collaborates with what we have uh, seen uh, based on the common information in the public domain. Uh, and, and so this, this, this is kind of what is now we know for certainty. So um, the sequence information of the SARS-CoV-2 is used to, uh, uh, so if you use a phylogenetic analysis and cluster them, we find that they cluster into various clades. Now, uh, what happened was uh, sub, uh, these clades are generally A and B, which are very common in East Asia. The original um, clade that was uh, that is somewhere here, that was which was where the originating lineages of the virus in Wuhan uh, is called central haplotype, 
and it's clado and then from there the various other a and b clades and uh, uh, lineages developed uh, as the pandemic went on and the viral transmissions uh, started happening across the globe so what we find is that between any two lineages there are on average five mutations uh, from the founding haplotype and and uh, the a and b haplotypes are mostly common in east asia uh, the b1 haplotype is the, was actually in the center of the outbreak in west coast of us early on and a2a uh, the, the haplotype a2a is initially exclusively reported from europe and from europe it spread to other parts of the world and a2a will will be talking about a2a a little more later on so the sequence data can also provide information on how the transmissions happened and were introduced into a country now this is on your right side this small panel consists of data from iceland the icelandic population is you know very well studied and and there there uh, what they did was once during the outbreak they uh, there was this data that uh, they analyzed from the icelandic population and found that different colors represent different haplotypes and if you see so almost there was a sequential entry of each haplotype into the icelandic in iceland and that is what this info sequence information provides uh the sequence information also is used to do uh, generate contact tracing networks now these are very important to understand how the um, uh, the transmissions are happening who is the founder case and from where the cluster cases are happening and for identifying localities hospitals where such transmissions are happening or public crowded places so this information can be used to construct the contact tracing networks so based on the sequence data again this is again from the iceland population you can see that so there are these contact tracing nest networks that were developed these are simple simpler ones where you know for a single founding uh, uh, sequence line uh, sequence of the virus there were these clusters of cases where the transmissions happened and that is clearly made out then there are more complex cases like this where it is very difficult to identify which one is the uh, originating source but you what one can make out is that uh, there are one or two possible uh, originating uh, so source and then subsequently this is how the the infections and transmission started happening and you can actually document all individuals on the right side you see that uh, this is a very useful uh, very interesting information here we see that in the same population so there was this group of people who were exp so in iceland both initial transmissions happened both from italy and from austria but you can see that uh, the the, uh, the haplotypes from italy the lineages from italy were the ones that that actually were transmitted uh, more efficiently uh, in the early part of the outbreak this kind of sequence information has made us understand how this pandemic is progressing so here in the initial transmissions were all based mostly based on travel but then as the pandemic progressed one can see that the, the incidences transmissions that happened from travel gradually reduced whereas uh, the transmissions in the families or in workplaces uh, or in social networks they 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 started getting increasing more so so although the in the initial part of the pandemic the the viruses were introduced in different parts of the globe because of travel people travel from the one place to another and and they carried the in infection but subsequently now once this infection is established in a country the the local transmissions uh, have taken over this is a data from uk and if you see uh, so this based on the sequence information uh, the lineages of the virus which originate which originated the transmissions were identified now based on this you can find that the absolute the initial at the early beginning the in the uk the initial transmissions were mostly from mostly from italy subsequently there were transmissions from spain belgium france and so forth china and so forth 
But what is interesting to see is that the transmissions from the Italy actually, although they initially happen, after that they were severely restricted, which might mean that the people who infected persons who actually traveled from Italy initially transmitted the virus were probably um, uh, put under very effective quarantine or they themselves followed uh, quarantine measures and hence uh, their transmissions from them were reduced. Whereas, unfortunately, the same is not true from the transmissions that happened from other countries. So, uh, other cases, the in transmissions continued to work. So, maybe the, the quarantine measures were not that effective. So, this is uh, the A to A is the sequence hap uh, haplotype that is mostly very, very popular, and people know that. Well, we saw that this uh, transmissions. Uh, in the A to A, uh, which are a signature of the European mutation uh, lineages of the virus, which was devastated Europe, actually had a founder mutation uh, called D614G in the spike glycoprotein, which means that there was this aspart there's an aspartate residue which is mutated to glycine. Now, aspartate to glycine is uh, expected to lead to a significant change in the uh, structure. Uh, uh, impact on the structure of the protein because aspartate is a negatively charged side chain and uh, glycine is a polar but uh, uh, neutral uh, side chain. Now this is located in a particular position in the 614 position in the spike glycoprotein and initially uh, data from some of us who worked uh, our institute like Professor Majumdar and Nidan who worked and the initial data that has been submitted in the global database they first analyzed this and came out with the hypothesis that A to A is kind of bearing the D614G mutation is kind of taking over the uh, outbreak in most places in the globe. So although there were initially you find that there are many other uh, uh, lineages, but once A to A emerges or gets transmitted, that takes over for, the, uh, for most of the outbreak in a particular area. So if you see there are these different linear uh, haplotypes, and over time, you can see that uh, A to A has kind of spread much more effectively compared to the other, other haplotypes. Now, similarly, this is the data that shows um, in a different countries and globally, the same thing is happening. The A to A is kind of taking over uh, most, of the, most of the other um, haplotypes in almost all parts of the globe. So it, there is this now this D614G uh, and A2A are probably the most most um, important uh, strains to actually investigate, and people are very curious about what is it, what does it mean? Does this mean that we have a super uh, strain of the virus, which and what is the impact or clinical impact? Now uh, it's very difficult, but. Uh, there is something else that information that has also been generated with the D614G mutated, mutated strains. Now, if you, if all of you are aware that diagnosis of the SARS-CoV-2 is done by real-time PCR and uh, that uh, real-time PCR, there's something called CT value or threshold cycle value, which is used. The lower the CT value, probably the viral number, uh, concentration of the viral targets are more in that sample, which is collected from nasopharyngeal swab or oropharyngeal swab. Now, it has been found that the viruses with the glycine at 614 compared to the aspartate at 614 are associated with a lower CT value. Now, this CT value is kind of a surrogate marker of the viral load of these nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swab samples taken from these individuals. So, uh, this data indicates that probably G614 is associated with a higher viral load compared to D614. Now, very difficult to say this because during the infection in an individual, initially there is a higher load of viral, uh, there is a high viral concentration load and then the viral load goes down. But uh, in, the, in spite of all those variabilities, we can still say that six four, G614 mutation is associated with a, probably a higher viral load of the virus. And there were then subsequent studies which showed now that uh, compared to D614, G614 bearing viruses have more intact virions 
containing the spike glycoprotein that are that are actually uh, that emerge from an infected cell uh, also it has been found that this g614 probably is associated with more efficient infection using the s2 uh, in the s2 s2 receptor expressing cells so combined with this information we believe that d614 g is associated with a more efficient transmission we also uh, there are a lot of other interesting features on the genomic sides of the virus where uh, it has been found that uh, that if you so there is a measure of what is the distribution of non synonymous and synonymous mutations that happen in a mutating genome like the sars cov 2 so when this was uh, so there is something measured by the something called the dnds ratio the higher is the dnds ratio there is more proportion of uh, non synonymous mutations compared to synonymous mutations in that particular genome so that when we it has been found that the, the sars cov 2 actually has a higher dnds ratio uh, compared to um, many of these other uh, related viruses like the mars cov and other outbreak, sars uh, cov uh, isolates so uh, this so this this is very interesting and that means that there might be a chance that this higher dnds ratio is actually associated with higher virulence of the virus the way it has been so efficiently transmitting compared to other related viruses this dn by ds ratio might hold a clue now if when we look into what kind of changes happen in the genome we find that of all possible combination of changes the c2u Remember, this is an RNA virus, so instead of T, we have uh, um, we have your S. So C two uh, U changes, C two U changes predominate in all. The happen preferentially so with the mutation is predominant in only and is not found in the other strand now what does this mean so all these sequencing uh, this mutation signatures point out that this is this is this is a key signature of a host cell uh, mutation mechanism uh, and <clears throat> they are one of the mechanisms uh, in addition to many there is one of one kind of mechanism by which the host cell actually fights uh, the viral rna viral infections so uh, there is an ongoing uh, mutation uh, signature uh, which is driven by apoberg in sars cov 2 infections in the host cell and it may so happen that you know many many years down the line this dn by ds ratio might drop because of these apoberg driven signatures and then this virus might become less virulent so while uh, this early part of the epidemic there was this lockdown measures in place uh, we uh, decided to uh, some of us were like getting restless in our homes we were feeling that you know we can actually come out and contribute uh, probably generate some information which must be might be useful to understand the pandemic and um, but there were very uh, there, there, this very difficult uh, situation. Uh, there was the people who were not being allowed to go on the street. So we contacted district administration, got special permits for us to move around. Otherwise, we would have been arrested when we were moved, uh, our, uh, coming out of our homes. And we started working on collecting viral RNA from nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swab of positive patients in West Bengal in collaboration with. Um, a national ICMR, National Institute of Communicable Diseases, and and started sequencing the viral genome. So, and the initial, the absolutely few, first few initial results were published in uh, uh, to to provide some some analytical uh, information, and the sequences were deposited.
limited in GZ, which is the public repository, where which, so that others can use that information for public health benefit. Now, uh, so what we found was that there are this list of patients, and what we found was that we could correlate. So we could actually we could we we found uh, from the sequence data we could go back and predict what does the in, uh, the initiating lineage of the virus to which country it belonged, and we found that the initial sequences that we did the initial the, these were probably originated from strains in UK and uh, and other parts of Europe. So uh, and in many of these cases, not all, there was success sufficient contact information which actually corroborated that result. So that was that was something that was very interesting. Proved that the sequence information can be used to track down this information. The other interesting feature we found was that we looked at the CT values of the diagnostic PCR for these patients for SARS-CoV-2, and we looked at the viral genome sequence depth we got, and we found a nice negative correlation. So lower the CT value, higher are the uh, viral uh, RNAs, uh, viral reads that you obtain from these patients. This is the phylogenetic analysis. Most of the sequences were A to A, and except uh, and many of these had established contact histories uh, with people from Europe or they traveled from Europe. And and then there was this uh, one or two occasional isolates which were related to China. We also found very interesting, um, uh, sorry, very interesting uh, uh, cluster, many many non-synonymous mutations in different viral coded genes. In particular, other than the D614G and other uh, clade defining mutations, we also found there's a cluster of contiguous three base mutation in the uh, in in the in the N protein, uh, the gene that codes for the N protein, uh, and we and uh, interestingly, these three contiguous bases result in a two amino acid change, where uh, the first one is the uh, 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 arginine is mutated to lysine and the glycine is mutated to arginine. Now, arginine to lysine is not very important because they are both positively charged in local context. But glycine to arginine is very important because a neutral polar amino acid gets changed to a positively charged amino acid. So, uh, uh, this uh, N protein mutation actually was picked up by us and studied in more detail. The, our collaborators in IISC looked into, into the MI, small RNA binding sites and found that this mutation actually results in loss of seven known miRNA binding sites in this uh, N protein and, and results in introduction of three binding sites for three new uh, small RNAs, uh, miRNAs. Now, uh, they, we looked in further and found that many of these miRNAs, which is whose binding is altered because of this mutation actually results in, uh, have differential um, uh, differential expression in many of the comorbidities of this uh, viral infections like type 2 diabetes cancer uh, etc so uh, these mutations it, uh, might play an important role uh, in in altering the miRNA binding and hence might lead to some changes which are related to comorbidity driven disease severity but the data is not there for us to comment on it uh, at this point of time we also found our collaborators in isc also found that the structural changes caused by these con con uh, con uh, contiguous uh, change in the two amino acids uh, results in a change pro predicted change in the peptide backbone in the nucleocapsid region. So this is the wild type where you have arginine uh, and uh, and in the in the mutated this is the mutated one where you have um, uh, sorry where you have glycine and here you have arginine. So you can see that the introduction of the arginine actually results in more interactions with other amino acid residues nearby. There are two serines and one distant arginine and that causes a predicted change in the uh, peptide backbone of nucleocapsid. So these are some of the interesting information. Now, based on this, now the government of India came up based on some of the results that we published. Uh, Department of Biotechnology came up with, uh, asked us to form a consortium. So we have formed the Pan India 1000 SARS-CoV-2 RNA Genome Sequencing Consortium. We are sequencing 1000 SARS-CoV-2 genomes from all over the country. 
with our networks and this result will be published very soon available in the public domain so here basically what we are doing we are collecting samples from all over the country so taking the swabs rnas sequencing them and subsequently very soon we will also look into host exome and transcriptome data to understand disease severity or infection susceptibility kind of uh, uh, relationships now this is switching gears i would just take a couple of more slides to explain uh, this is on the virus side of things now on the host side uh, so uh, there were these uh, so people try to understand how what is the what is the what is the changes in the ability efficiency of infection or what kind of cells get affected because the one thing that was integrating people were that although we know that the ace2 receptor uh, ace2 expressing cells of the air passage uh, are, are mostly infected and then the lungs get affected but in most of these covid-19 uh, diseases in the hospital we are also seeing multi organ affections so many many organs are getting affected and what is happening so so um, there was uh, what we understood so that was is human something called the human cell atlas where people are working on building a single cell uh, gene expression catalog of all tissues of human and mouse and uh, the, we are also work as a part of this uh, atlas in certain ways uh, so this human cell group from human cell atlas they actually used their data which is already substantially generated and found that the ace2 receptor expression uh, also so the so the entry of the virus requires ace2 receptor as well as a uh, combination of uh, certain cellular proteases uh, which results in cleavage of the s1 s2 region of the spike like reporting and entry so based on the single cell rna seq data it was found that there were not only the known ce earlier cells in the lung alveolar cells as well as uh, air passage cells uh, which expressed as2 and this proteases but there are a whole range of different cells in different tissues of the body which actually express these uh, proteins and hence are susceptible to sars cov2 infection so uh, it was there was some this interesting data where it was shown that with age with age this certain subtypes or uh, certain subsets of the cells like the club or the goblet cells which are known to be infected by sars cov 2 uh, their as2 expression actually uh, goes up with age so uh, this is all the mouse data but you can see that uh, there is this higher expression of as2 as the age progresses so this this shows that you know probably this can be um, uh, hyperjected to the fact that you know there is this higher age related to uh, more susceptibility to uh, sars cov2 infection now we also looked into certain cells like the secretory cells and a2 cells and it was this looked into what is the effect of smoking and it was found that uh, smoking is associated with a higher expression relative frequency of this uh, as2 expression compared to um, compared to uh, cells where which are from individuals not who, who have not smoked so at least in the secretory cells which are ones those are infected by the virus so these are different kind of data which shows this in as2 expression is higher in in the cells which are exposed to smoking compared to uh, those which are not exposed to smoking so age and smoking actually uh, has uh, res probably results in higher susceptibility to sars cov2 infection and this was the first single cell uh, data which kind of predict uh, confirmed uh, this understanding Rec Recently, you might have seen that there is this a uh, lot of questions and consortiums have formed to understand the variability in disease severity. So, if given two people get infected with SARS-CoV-2, one of them might develop severe disease and ultimately die in hospital. The other person may remain, continue to remain to be asymptomatic. Now, what is the what is the basis by which, even though they are infected by the same virus, they have difference in in uh, <coughs> this disease severity 
now this was this is the first results that have come out from this uh, gwas consortium on severe covid 19 respiratory failure where uh, people looked into what are the host genomic correlates of uh, markers of disease severity like requirement for oxygen supplementation or hospital support now this was conducted in very difficult times in italy and spain at the peak of the outbreak when these countries were practically shut down and uh, being devastated by this outbreak this jiwa study was continued where samples were collected from general population and people from hospital and uh, genome wide uh, so genotyping was performed using microarray the jiwa's data the if severity of the outbreaks was so high in italy and spain that the jiwa's data was actually being sent, sent to sweden and germany who at that time had <coughs> less of the outbreak and the data was analyzed there so the results show that there are two different regions in the uh, genome which uh, this is a typical manhattan plot where uh, the association uh, uh, strength of the associations are represented by these vertical heights and uh, it, and and the and the x axis denotes the entire genome in the different chromosomes so it was found that the two locations 3p21.3 and 9q34.2 these were the two regions of the genome which had genome level significant association with the uh, oxygen supplementation and disease severity now what does this two loci contain 3p21.3 it was found that there is a risk allele ga in a particular snp uh, rs11385942 that is associated with reduced expression of cxcr6 and increased expression of sl6 uh, 6a20 now these are again uh, many of these uh, then there is another which is lztfl1 that was also a gene which is located nearby and that is strongly expressed in human lung cells now this sl c6 a20 encodes sodium amino acid proline transporters and uh, ccr9 and ccr6 regulates specific location of lung resident memory cd8 t cells so these are so these contain cluster of genes which might have some biological significance thus now functional in vitro functional studies are required to understand the strength of uh, and, and understand how these genomic results can be <coughs> can be converted to biological understanding other loci contains the abo locus now that has been in news of late and and what the results of the jiwas indicates is that people with blood group a <coughs> had a higher risk of developing severe disease compared to the other blood groups and people with at group o has a lower risk significantly lower risk of developing severe disease compared to the other blood groups now when i say this these the, these reported by some parallel non genetic studies that have been published i also serve this caution that it being into the strip saying that i will similarly grouping that uh, his or her blood group the higher severe disease these are relative risks compared to other blood groups and none of these are related to susceptibility to infection these are risk for developing severe disease they are result of the jivas have to be taken in as the state and we await uh, deep deeper biological uh, uh, in, uh, in phd programs 
vibrant we have one genome hall one genome uh, any time later on when situations are normal and the campus is open i personally invite all of you who are listening to my talk to come and look at our and also visit the human genome hall gives Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I thank you so much for such an informative talk, sir. We really loved the part about the where you mentioned about pan genome of SARS-CoV-2 se sequencing initiative by DBT, and uh, we'd really like to visit you in I in IBMG sometime. And your your explanation has actually enlightened us, and it has opened like a broader perspective of what we have been hearing about and what we wish to know. So with this, I'd like to move on to the question answer session. We have certain questions. And if audience has any question, kindly please write in the live chat box. So as we're talking about genomes and its implications, so, so the first question that I have here is that how can genomic data help us to understand the number of active strains in individuals infected with a single or multiple lineage of SARS-CoV-2? So, so I am asking that uh, how does genomic data help us to understand the number of active strains in individuals and uh, who are infected with a single or multiple lineage of SARS-CoV-2? Could you tell us how the genomic data help us to understand this part? So are you able to hear me, sir? Yes, yes, no. Yes. So I'll just repeat the question that we have. Uh, so we're yeah, talking sure, about sure. genomics and genomic data. So the question, the first question that we have is that how does this genomic data help us to understand the number of active strains in individuals who might be infected with single or multiple lineages of SARS-CoV-2? How could genomic data help in that? Interesting question. I, I compliment the uh, individual person who has actually, uh, from the audience, who has actually raised this question. This is something that is of a lot of curiosity of late. So there are two ways on how to uh, we are using the genomics data. The first is uh, when we isolate the RNA and we perform uh, meta uh, genomic sequencing of the RNA, or we amplify the viral genome and sequence. Uh, what we try to report is the consensus sequence, which is of the most predominant or the only lineage of the virus that is present in the individual. Until now, most of the efforts had been focused in this because people wanted to report quickly, generate as much as sequence data as quickly as possible. But only now, uh, interest has shifted to us understanding whether to a same indi in single individual harbors multiple lineages of the virus or harbors the same lineage with multiple mutations. Now, this is something where research is, we have started 
working on it. The data contains. So there are uh, because we use next generation sequencing, we use a very high sequence depth. So for each position, we do see uh, if there are multiple lineages or multiple mutations, mutated viruses in the same individual. We see those, all of those. But then it requires. to take that into account and build all possible mutation data. That information is there, and it is only of late that people have started looking into it. OK, thank you, sir. So, sir, as you're talking about mutations, and uh, we talked, you mentioned in the slide about the emergence of D614G mutation. So, sir, these are like specific mutations. And uh, we would like to ask that how long can it take to determine such specific mutations and uh, could these uh, like could technical artifacts be a reason for you know for some of these mutations that are occurring yes there had been a lot of i didn't uh, didn't mention those but there has been extensive work in which uh, many interesting uh, mutated mutation patterns which were initially identified were subsequently traced down to uh, sequencing artifacts or artifacts related, but uh, D614. But there and then there are there are many tests, and uh, hmm. uh, that one can do to understand whether this is a true mutation or the likely to be a true mutation or due to artifact. And D614G has passed all that. No doubt that it is a true mutation. Uh, how long does it take to emerge in a particular mutation? Well, mm -hmm. that is very difficult to say, but everything happened very quickly. Everything happened very quickly. So I think, I think uh, at least in SARS-CoV-2, what we are finding is because of very large number of transmissions happening, we are seeing that uh, evolution of mutated strains, particularly like D614G, which have some impact on the viral transmission ability, probably is happening extremely quickly. If you, I mean, it is. It's kind of a founder mutation that emerges and then takes over that particular place. Okay. So, so uh, in your one of your slides, you mentioned about the GWAS consortium and the studies that are going about it. So, can this uh, genome-wide association study, can these play a role in curbing the second wave of coronavirus, which is probably being predicted, and that could be more harmful than the first wave? No, but what it but this these kind of studies that uh, people have started doing, we will, we are also started in India. Uh, the, what is the but there is tremendous impact uh, of these studies for the public health, but in an entirely different way. For a country, say uh, no matter the SARS-CoV-2 has shown whether it is a, a European country which has substantial um, extensive health support, whereas come compared to a third world country or a developing country like us, where there is given the huge population size, the scarcity of health support. But what one thing has shown is that during this, in a very large, this, this scale of the outbreak, it's important to uh, marshal one's health resources, to understand who will need the health support and who will not. And then, you know, that's how you can efficiently manage your health support. The GWAS studies are actually pointing in that direction. They are generating information which if from there we can do a prediction. We can build a prediction tool by which, well, somebody gets infected with SARS-CoV-2. He comes out positive, but uh, he or she comes out positive. But based on this prediction, if we can also predict whether that individual has a higher risk for disease severity, then or the individual has very low risk for disease severity. In the second case, we can ask that person to have a, you know, at home containment will not require that kind of monitoring. But in the first case, that individual will probably, probably require more close monitoring and some provision for his or her health support in the hospital needs to be done. So that's how it will translate to more efficient usage of the public health system so that less deaths happen. Okay. 
okay so so can you forward this question so do you think that the sequencing genomes of the infected patients could that be helpful in some or the other way yes because we need to understand how the virus is evolving uh, the sequence data as i showed can be used to do contact tracing they build contact tracing networks understand how an outbreak is happening in a hospital or in a closed place or in a society or in some geographic location and uh, we are, the sequence data also provides inf information on mutations and and see if there are any subclones of mutants that are emerging some of these mutations can be in very important regions like for example uh, other than spike or nucleocapsid they can be in the rna dependent rna polymerase gene we also saw some, some mutations emerging already mm -hmm. so now this rdrt right, gene right. is yes. the target for um, antivirals right that are being developed so so what mm, the yes. impact significance of the mutation would be that this kind of information will be useful for monitoring those okay well thank you sir uh, with this we have reached the end of questions and uh, i once again express my gratitude for towards you for taking out time and uh, presenting this talk so i'm sure that the audience has thank gained you. a lot of knowledge and we have put to <laughs> thank you sir so and we've also put thank to you. Rest thank a lot you very of questions much. that might have arose in the mind of and uh, so i would also thank like you. to thank the scientists who who have been who have been attentive listeners and all our viewers who took out time to attend this talk uh, with this i would like to wrap up this session and uh, i'd be looking forward to seeing uh, looking forward to see you again for another collaboration sir and sure. to my audience we'd be saying that uh, please do stay connected for future such lectures and uh, kindly please subscribe to the youtube channel thank you